Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this month's Non-Farm Payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and to a report which ultimately I'm struggling to establish whether or not it's going to send markets higher or lower. Um, given what we've seen this week, we've seen some really, really strong gains. Um, we've seen a weaker dollar despite some fairly hawkish central bank commentary, not only from Jay Powell on Wednesday, but also from Madame Christine Lagarde, the ECB president on Thursday, but also the Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey on Thursday as well. So I think the big question and the main question that I've already been, that has already been directed my way is why is the market rallying? Um, despite tight labour markets and hawkish rhetoric from Jerome Powell, Christine Lagarde and um, Andrew Bailey? Well, it's a fairly simple answer. While central banks would like to give the impression they have further to go when it comes to more rate rises, markets are generally taking the opposite view. They're surmising, rightly or wrongly, that we're near a peak as far as rate rises are concerned, and even if central banks aren't done yet, they, they, they shortly will be. So it's really about not how many more rate, rate, rate hikes are coming, but when are they going to start to cut rates next? Uh, and that's really, I think, why you're getting the market rallying the way that we've seen this week. The first question is, are we done? And the answer to that, rightly or wrongly, is yes, because otherwise, how do you explain the sharp fall that we've seen in gilt yields this week, particularly in the UK five year, but also German yields, Italian yields, US yields, bond yields are all dropping, reflecting the fact that the bond market is pricing in rate cuts. Now, to my mind, that seems optimistic because it's not only yields are not only falling on five and ten year and thirty year, they're also falling on the two year. Um, and they're falling quite significantly. If you take, for example, um, the the bank base rate, the Bank of England base rate at four percent, UK five year is below three percent. So five years out. Not, I suppose it's not unreasonable to surmise that rates are likely to be quite a bit lower, but certainly not in the way that markets appear to be pricing it. And that's essentially, I think, why you're seeing the rally that you're getting in equity markets at the moment, because markets are not only pricing a peak in rates on the back of the area inflation is coming down, we're getting disinflation, they're putting the cart before the horse a little bit, because even if you think inflation is coming down. Let's not forget, all of these central banks have 2% inflation targets. So let's take a step back. Why would central banks cut rates when inflation, headline inflation and core inflation in particular, is still well above that target? They wouldn't, but the markets aren't thinking like that. Not at the moment. They're thinking rate hikes are coming to an end. And rather than thinking yippee, they're thinking rate cuts are coming next. Now, I think that part of the assessment is wrong. The first part, yeah, absolutely. I think potentially we are getting close to the point where rates, base rates may be near their peak. So I think there's potentially another 25 basis points coming from the Bank of England um, at, the, at the next meeting. Potentially, the Federal Reserve could do another 25 or it could even do another 50. And I think the fly in the ointment at the moment is the Federal Reserve, because I think the Fed funds rate is at 4.75 percent. We've heard a number of policymakers from the Federal Reserve argue that while a slowdown in the pace of rate rises is justified, most of them think of a terminal rate of around about 5.25 percent. Well, that's 50 basis points above where we are at the moment. So even though we've seen another slowdown, if we get a really strong jobs report this afternoon, then that could well mean that maybe we're not getting 
just another 25 basis points at the next meeting in March, or we're potentially getting another 25 in May. Certainly the ECB want us to think um, that beyond March, there's still going to be hiking rates. I mean, one thing that I took away from that press conference from the ECB on Thursday was they've almost pre-committed to raising by 50 basis points in March, even though Madame Lagarde did row back from it slightly. Um, to actually pre-commit in such a way that they're going to hike by 50 in March, while at the same time hiking by 50 now, it almost begs the question, why not do 100 now? What's stopping you? If you really think that inflation is going to be that sticky and core prices actually remained at a record high, even though the headline rate fell quite significantly, fell back from 9.2 to 8.5, but core prices remained at a record high. If you really think that inflation is going to be that sticky, why not just do 100 now? And then keep the option open of doing another 25 or 50 in March. Makes no sense. But this is essentially where we are at the moment. I don't think central banks know how quickly inflation is likely to come down. But I have a feeling, given the fact that an awful lot of the PMI indicators and the ISM indicators are showing that services prices are very sticky and are continuing to rise, that core prices aren't going to come down anywhere near as quickly, even as headline rates continue to fall. And certainly we've seen headline inflation in the EU fall to 8.5%. We've got German CPI next week. Will that come down or will or, or will that remain fairly sticky? German inflation numbers were delayed um, from this week because of some calculation errors. There seems to be a lot of that about because we had that with UK PPI numbers. There's calculation errors there as well. Um, you know, and PPI in the UK is around about 16 or 17 percent. So you're not seriously telling me that the Bank of England is going to start cutting rates by the end of this year if PPI is still well above 10%, because that generally tends to act as a leading indicator in headline CPI, which means that core prices here aren't going to come down very, very quickly unless there is a demand shock and people stop spending money. Then you might see um, the disinflation that you're seeing, particularly in the US, um, start to accelerate into outright deflation. But I don't think we're there yet, and it's certainly too early to price the sorts of moves that we've been seeing in bond markets and equity markets more broadly. Ultimately, though, if you've got a bearish view of US markets, which I had um, earlier this year, I've had to tear that up. I've had to tear that up simply on the basis of the fact that we've broken above those trend lines that I identified in previous, um, in previous um, webinars such as this. So if we start with the S&P, we can see now, this trend line to the downside has broken. We've now broken towards the upside and we are now starting to trend higher. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to continue to trend higher today. We could pull back, but certainly on the basis of this particular chart here, if you draw a line through the lows, the 50 day and the 200 day moving average have crossed over. That generally tends to be reasonably positive. Um, and certainly the, the S&P, um, the 200-day moving average, it's flat. It's not pointing in the same direction. But nonetheless, downside momentum has diminished. And consequently, because that's happened, I have to revise my overall outlook when it comes to the S&P 500. That's not to say that I don't think European markets won't continue to outperform US markets, because I think once um, investors realize that we're probably not going to get rate cuts this year, then I think the um, investor enthusiasm for US stocks could well start to diminish simply on the basis of the fact that valuations there are um, so much higher than they are in Europe and the UK. I'm still of the opinion that the FTSE 100 can go to 8,000 this year, break through its previous record highs of 7,903 back in 2018. And obviously the peaks that we saw last month at 78, 75. But for the here and now, the fact that we've managed to break above this downtrend line and the 50 and 200 day moving averages does suggest the US markets are starting to gain a little bit of momentum and could well extend back to this level here 
which is 4,300 over the course of the next few days and weeks. Obviously, an awful lot will depend on the data, future CPI reports, um, jobs reports, but the US labor market is tight. Weekly jobless claims are 183,000. Um, they're back down to the levels they were around about April last year. And at some point, um, that is going to start get reflected in wages data. Wages data has been a little bit on the weak side. If you look at the ADP payrolls data, that's trending at around about, um, wage growth is trending at about seven and a half, eight percent um, And the ADP report was a little bit weaker than expected this week at 106,000. But if you look at the vacancies, the vacancy rates in the US, there's 1.7 jobs um, per worker. 11, over 11 million job vacancies in the US. So that suggests to me that um, a healthy jobs market will mean that we're not going to get a sharp fall in inflation going forward. So the first three or four percent, that's the easy bit, down from eight, nine, ten percent, that's the easy bit. Where does the extra two or three percent come from? You know, and I think that's the big question going forward. And for that, I don't have an answer. All I can tell you is what I think based on the price action in the markets right now. And the price action is telling me that it's very much by the dips now for equity markets. We could well see further gains. At the moment, we're looking to retest these peaks on the S and on, on, on the FTSE 100. Similarly, on the DAX, if we look at the DAX as well here, we've got a nice little trend line here, 11 month highs, second, second of Feb. So you're talking about you're potentially retesting the highs of last year, which is around about 16,000 over the course of the next few days and weeks. And, and why? Because ultimately energy prices haven't been anywhere near as bad as markets thought they would be at the end of October. Natural gas prices have fallen off a cliff. Um, oil prices are down and look as if they're going to stay down. And it's, it's particularly interesting when you look at crude oil prices, this downtrend line so far has been has remained intact. We got a little bit of an intraday penetration through there at the end of January, but ultimately since those peaks back in June, oil prices have been trending lower. Now you can probably put a trend line through there and come up with a nice little triangle. So I'll be keeping an eye on that particular um, pattern formation over the course of the next few days and weeks. As for Euro dollar, let's have a quick look at that. Again, uh, we've broken above 110, but what was struck me about that is the sharp retreat that we saw on the back of that 50 basis point. I mean, that was as hawkish as hawkish can be with respect to the ECB. And what did the euro do? It went down. So that suggests to me that potentially we could see the short term, short term top, but we're not going to dip that far. We are still very much in an uptrend for euro dollar. And the next key support is in and around these sorts of lows down here at around about 108.20. So there's the bottom of that doji candle there, about 108, 108.20. We could see a dip back there. Uh, and again, you know, the line of least resistance is that the euro will probably continue to strengthen and the dollar will continue to weaken. My view on dollar yen still remains for a, view, a move back to 125 and potentially 120. Why? Because that's what the trend is telling me, lower highs, and lower lows. Now we have got a little bit of support down here, but we've broken back down and we could well see 127.20 and then a test of this 50% retracement here at 126.5 from the up move from the lows back in March 2020 to the highs that we saw back in October last year. All of this points to dollar weakness, but it's not going to be a straight line. You're going to get peaks and troughs, you're going to get ups and downs. And ultimately, it's about picking your entry points. And at the moment, for me, the line of least resistance for the dollar is for a foot for dollar weakness. And ultimately, you then have to basically pick your entry and exit points. We have a quick look at the market calendar and see what's coming up with respect to um, wages. I think the wages numbers are going to be particularly interesting. So it's 0.3% month on month, 4.3% year on year, expecting a fall there. So to my mind, the wages data 
this average earnings data really is utterly meaningless because it doesn't really reflect what's going on in the private sector of the US economy. And the private sector of the US economy is much, much bigger than what you would call public pay rates. So for me, I think there's a little bit of a, a little bit stuff misleading going on there uh, when it comes to what average earnings are telling us. We've got the unemployment rate is expected to edge a little bit higher. Non-farm payrolls, 223 to 185. That's down here as well. Um, I've got a little alert set up, which I've basically turned on so that it's there to remind me half an hour before the numbers get released. So if I'm working or looking on a market, I can actually get reminded that be careful, there's numbers coming up. I may want to look at um, paring down positions or what have you. Um, obviously, next week we've got RBA rate decision. That'll be particularly interesting. But uh, I'm not even going to start thinking about the, the here and now. If we get a fairly decent number from payrolls, we should see a little bit of a dollar bounce. So we could see euro dollar slip back to below 109, revisit the lows of yesterday. Similarly, the pound as well. If we get a particularly uh, weak number, obviously that will, to a certain extent, um, help push markets higher. But I think that's what that's the way the markets want to go anyway. Markets want to go up. Markets want to believe the narrative that we're going to get a soft landing, that energy prices are going to remain low, and that at some point we are going to get rate cuts um, by the end of this year. That narrative is not going to change on the basis of one payrolls report. We've also got a host of revisions from today's January numbers, and an awful lot of those revisions will reflect the numbers in December, November, and October. So this one number is not going to really tell us overall too much about the health of the US labor market. So hopefully that's answered your question about the dollar rally at the tight labor market and the hawkish rhetoric from Powell. You know, in a nutshell, markets think central banks are done or pretty close to being done. And ultimately, they now think that we're going to get rate, hurt, rate cuts by the end of this year. As I said, the second part of that, I just can't, I can't see it. I can't see it at all. And I think once, if markets suddenly realise that's not going to happen, you could see a sharp reversal. But you're not going to see that in February. You're probably not going to see it in March. And you may not see it in April. We'll have to wait and see what central banks have to say, how the data evolves over the course of the next few days weeks and months but for the here and now let's sit tight and wait for the numbers here we 517 <laughs> oh my goodness gracious me i mean that is just huge and but look at the revision as well 260,000 on the payrolls numbers, I mean that is immense. I mean that is such a, I mean that's rates are going to rates are going to go through the roof. Unemployment rate 3.4. They've revised up the average hourly earnings to 4.4.9. Um, I mean that that is that is just incredible when you actually look at how at how completely off the chart that payrolls number actually is you know it's absolutely incredible one second so let's have a quick get rid of all of these just trying to digest that so massive dollar rally probably see equity markets yet come coming off not really surprising when you when you when you look at that so i suggested that we're probably going to see a move lower I mean, the US, the US labor market is on steroids. I mean, that is just completely incredible. You're likely to see all yields back up on, on, on the back of that. And the market complacency is really come, going to come back and bite them. I'm going to look into that. Um, I'm going to look into that uh, unemployment number because I want to see whether or not we've got a similar fall in the labor participation rate. So the labor participation rate has gone up to here we go 62.4 so it's edged higher it's back to the highest levels that it was last year the underemployment rate has also gone up from 6.5 to 6.6 4.4 on wages and as i say 4.9 
was um, adjusted higher on wages. So that is that is pretty bullish, and I think that reasserts the hawkish, um, the fact that markets were underestimating how resilient inflation could well be, and um, that's why um, Powell was right to be hawkish, and why markets were, I think, a little bit wrong to ignore him. But again, this is one number. Um, the November number just has a ten does have a tendency to be a little bit of an outlier. A couple of years ago, the January number actually came in negative, and that was revised away in subsequent months. So it's very, very you've got to be very, very careful about reading too much into uh, one month's one month's data. But cer <laughs> certainly, I think that's a wake up you call. You're getting the FTSE 100. It's bouncing back on the back of that. Let's have a quick look at what the S&P is doing on a short-term basis. Let's make that a five-minute chart so we can see the market reaction. And there we are, five-minute chart, really sharp spike towards the downside. But again, the market just doesn't want to go down. And every time you get a little bit of a push lower, you suddenly get um, plenty of buyers start to creep in. But one, one, thing is, one, one thing I still think remains certain, we will see US markets open lower when trading starts in just under an hour's time, um, simply on the basis of those weak numbers that we got. Well, not weak numbers. It's, I mean, they're still fairly decent numbers from Amazon Alphabet and uh, um, Apple. But we did see big gains yesterday, and we are heading into the weekend. So you're going to get a little bit of end of week weakness anyway after such a strong showing this week. So certainly, I think in terms of US markets, we've probably seen the highs for the week. Um, but that's not to say that um, that's not to say that um, we won't uh, get a little bit of end of week weakness. Just going to have a quick look at the US two year yield on the back of those numbers because you would expect um, you would expect to see a little bit of a rebound in yields, US yields on the back of that. And we are eight basis points higher on the two year. So let's just have a quick look on a three day chart. I'm just going to bring that in in a minute. There we go. So obviously that's yesterday. Or oh, Friday night, Wednesday night. That's the PAL coming down yesterday. And now we're backing up again. So getting a little bit of a rebound in yields. As you can see up here, we're heading back to 420. Um, so we're nine basis points up on the day. But what's interesting about this, I think, in particular, is that if you look at the two-year yield over the course of the past few months, we've not really broken out of the range that we've been in since September. You look at the lows back in September, October, around about 409, 410. We made a marginal new, new low in January at 408, but we haven't broken below 4%. So when you strip back all the noise, when you strip back all the narrative, US two-year yields are still within the range they've been in since October, which suggests to me that at the moment, the bond market, we're saying that monetary conditions, you know, financial conditions are fairly loose. They haven't really changed much since September, October. Um, the two-year yield is still in, in the range that it's been in for quite some time. And yes, you could argue that the, low, that the highs are getting lower, but if you look at these peaks through here, it's been pretty much the same, 425 on the upside, 405 on the downside. What I would expect to see in terms of a real sea change on the two year is a break of that 405, 425 range to give a real decent indication as to the direction of US rates. At the moment, the two year yield is still above the Fed funds rate, unlike in the UK, where the two year yield is actually below. The headline rate, which seems bizarre. Actually, what am I talking about? It, it, it's, it's below the it's below the Fed funds rate, 4.5 to 4.75. So I'm talking nonsense. Um, so forget I just said that. Um, so yeah, I mean that's essentially where we are. U.S. yields, U.K. yields, they're all trading below the headline benchmark rate. So certainly markets are pricing in rate cuts. The bigger question is whether or not they're going to get them. And I'm not convinced at the moment that that's being priced accurately by the markets. 
Right, just been asked a question. Don't we know how do we know how many of these jobs are part time? And couldn't we argue everyone is going back to work because they can't afford um not to? Yeah, I mean, I think there's an element of that, Alan, most definitely. I think you're finding that an awful lot of people who retired early uh, have suddenly realized that actually their retirement income is not compensating for the big rise in the in, in the cost of living. We're certainly seeing that in the UK. Um and certainly I think there is an awful lot of people who are still or had still yet to come back into the labor market. And if you look at the US participation rate, that is very apparent. Um, before the pandemic, the US participation rate was 63.4%. It's now 62.4%. So you've had a 1% dropout in the US labor market. Um, we don't know how many of those jobs are part time. Um, because unlike in Canada, they don't split out part time and full time jobs in the Canadian jobs report. That does happen. Um, you get a split out of, of part time and full time jobs. But certainly I think there is an element that an awful lot of people are doing two different jobs on a part time basis. My niece, for example, lives in the United States. She's a single mother and she has two part time jobs because she has to look after her young son um, and a full time job does not help in that regard. But at two part-time jobs, that it means that she is able to manage her time that much better. So you could certainly, um, you, you know, you can certainly make a case for saying that an awful lot of these jobs are part-time jobs, um, but not all of them. Um, another question. Da -da -da -da. Do you personally think the US will have a recession if you don't mind me? Yeah, um, with the labor market as it is, I think we're still on for a soft landing. Um, I hate that expression. Um, but yeah, I think given where given where GDP is at the moment, given the unemployment rate, I think the US can probably avoid a recession. It doesn't mean we're not going to get a slowdown. Um, I think we'll still get a slowdown. But I think if the US can avoid um, slipping into a recession and un unemployment start to go up, and at the moment there's little little indication that that won't happen, then um, I think it's quite quite reasonable that they can probably avoid a significant recession. I think um, what we've seen from the data so far suggests that there is still an awful lot of tightness in the US labor market. There's still not enough workers to fill the available roles. And even with the job losses that are being announced in the tech sector at the moment, there's more than enough vacancies to cover for those. Having said that, you know, and this is this is this is an area that I struggle a little bit with. An awful lot of the jobs that we're seeing in the US, all the vacancies are in hospitality, they're in travel, they're in leisure. And an awful lot of the job losses that we're seeing are in tech. Now, some of them, you know, they're sort of warehouse staff, Amazon and what have you, but an awful lot of those jobs will obviously be more highly paid say, for example, than the vacancies that are coming on stream. So you could actually get a reduction in spending patterns in terms of personal spending because the jobs that are, the jobs are being lost are much more highly salaried than the ones that are coming back as vacancies. So you could, you could get an erosion of spending power within the US economy. So there's certainly, uh, certainly there's, there's an element of that in there. And if you actually look at the retail sales numbers within the US, in November and December, they were really disappointing. But you then have to factor that into the fact that the first 10 months of the 2022, retail sales growth was really strong. So um, what we're seeing at the moment with respect to this jobs number suggests that while the narrative of potentially um, a stronger dollar and rates may be higher for longer, the US economy is holding up fairly well. And that, in essence, should mean that the US avoids a recession. And that's perhaps why the downside that we're seeing in equity markets is being slightly, um, you know, we're getting a little bit of a bounce back as we look at the S&P there. We're still well off the lows. This is another five minute candle. I mean, we could have another crack on the downside. Um, but, you know, we're holding up fairly well, given the fact that Today's jobs report 
has blown a, a little bit of a hole in the argument of rate cuts later this year because why would you cut rates if you've got a tight labor market and average hourly earnings wages and what have you are resilient you simply wouldn't you'd only cut rates in response to an economic slowdown and at the moment judging by the the jobs data that's not you know that that's not that's not that's not an argument that uh, can be made um any other questions on any other markets that i haven't covered at the moment ladies and gents i would say that i am recording this so um if any of you want to sort of circle back to anything that i've um talked about with respect to um these numbers or look at some of the chart points and what have you that i was talking about earlier it'll be up on youtube later this afternoon under youtube.com forward slash cmc markets plc um right gold i've been asked about gold yeah i mean gold is very much a rate story yields of yields are higher so gold is lower um what's particularly interesting here is that this looks like a bullish a bearish reversal on gold which is quite interesting which suggests to me that now we've broken below these lows um we should actually see a move lower um so um you could see a little bit of a little bit of a counter reaction in respect of the gold price on the back of the move higher in yields us two year yields are now 11 basis points higher so we are starting to see a little bit of a um a correction after the big drops that we've saw that we've seen over the course of the past couple of days so gold is lower this looks like a bearish engulfing day let's have a quick look at that there so let's go there we go so that is, this usually happens at the end of an uptrend we do appear to have had confirmation of this break lower um, and consequently we could well see a move back to the 50-day moving average of around about 1842 over the course of the next few sessions the only reason the only way that that would not come about is if we then broke back above the highs of today which is 1920 so certainly i think it does appear to be some indication that we could see a little bit of a correction in gold over the course of the next few days it'd be interesting to see if we get a little bit of a rally um, off the lows off, off, off around about at the 1880 level being asked about kiwi let's see if we can find the old kiwi dollar down sharply one percent at the moment let's have a look at that slightly lower that's interesting uh, Let's look at a four hour chart. So we've got, we've got some decent peaks through there, and we've got oh, not that. Let's extend that back. these these three lows here 64 13 64 17 64 so kiwi looks as if it's shaping up for a little bit of a push lower um certainly a potentially a retest of around about 63 60 um on on the basis of those numbers but again heading into the weekend there could be a little bit of an unwind going on so um as with anything when you're trading on a friday afternoon leave yourself room that you're able to get out of the position before you go home for the weekend because otherwise you could find you end up wearing it and i never like running anything over the weekend if i can help it there used to be a time when i was trading fx back in the day that i would run stuff over the weekend um, i tend not to do it so much now there's just too much risk involved in doing it because you just get these gaps appear if you're the right side of it great but if you're the wrong side of it it can prove to be very painful and very expensive so um i've got slightly more risk averse when it comes to running stuff over the weekend in my old age uh, but certainly i think um given what we've seen so far there is potential for the dollar to go on a little bit of a run over the course of the next few days dollar cad okay so let's get rid of that 
need to redraw that. Let's draw a line through these lows here. Yeah, we've got the 200 day moving average on the dollar CAD. You've got decent support in and around 132. You've got the Canadian payrolls report next Friday. That should give us an indication as to whether or not the Bank of Canada is inclined to do any more rate hikes. But well, they're not. They've said they're going to pause. So um, if you think there's rate hikes off the table for the Bank of Canada, if you think there's further oil price weakness in the price, then the Canada could well weaken relative to the US dollar. And we could see a move back to the 50 day moving average in this trend line resistance from here. Certainly the Bank of Canada has signaled that it's not going to be raising rates at its next meeting. And it's really just a question of what is the Fed going to do at the next meeting? And it's likely they could do another 25. And think I would say I would suggest that judging by today's payrolls report, another 25 is pretty much on the table for the US with potentially another 25 after that. Whereas the markets were pricing in maybe 25 and that's it. This payrolls report has thrown an awful lot of shade on that particular argument. So certainly I think potential for a little bit of short term dollar strength on the back of those payrolls numbers. Um, Aussie dollar, we've got the RBA next week. Um, the RBA is going to be particularly interesting simply on the basis of the fact that um, inflation in Australia actually jumped up to 8.4% in December from 7.3% in November. So there's no sign of a peak there, even though the RBA was one of the first central banks to slow down the pace of its rate hiking to 25 in November. So at the moment, the market's pricing 25 for next week. But there is an argument for potentially saying that they might want to do 50 and then sit for a bit. Um, particularly given the fact that fourth quarter CPI jumped from 7.3 to 7.8 percent. So the RBA may look at this week's Fed and ECB and Bank of England and think hawkish rhetoric isn't enough when it comes to um, forward guidance. Maybe we need to do rather than say. So there could be an outside chance the RBA might do 50 on the basis of those numbers because of the fact that they think that perhaps inflation is likely to be more resilient, perhaps. We'll have to wait and see. But for me, 25 is nailed on. The bigger question for me is they might surprise with a slightly more aggressive stance with a 50. We'll see. Anyway, we've also got UK fourth quarter GDP next week. That will that will tell us whether the UK economy went into re technical recession. Um, if they if the numbers come out, uh, say growth of 0.1, that would be a surprise. Certainly, I think the OBR and the Bank of England um, su have suggested that the bank that the UK economy is already in recession. Wouldn't be the first time they've both been wrong. So let's hope they're wrong this time. Certainly, I think the numbers that we saw in October and November do appear to suggest that the UK economy is slightly more resilient, perhaps, than was thought to be the case um, back in September. So, you know, may, maybe the UK economy does avoid a technical recession. I think either way, whatever the outcome of the GDP numbers, the nuance of whether we're in a technical recession or not is likely to be lost on an awful lot of people. Um, given how finances are going to be under strain, whether or not you get minus 0.1 or plus 0.1, it's neither here nor there, even though politically it probably plays um, slightly in the government's favour. I think most people couldn't care less. Um, they're struggling with the cost of living and that's all they really care about rather than an incremental change in the quarterly GDP numbers. Anyway, um, what else do we do? So Aussie dollar. So basically there's fairly decent support at 69.80. Um, looks like we could well have seen a little bit of a short term top there and look for a retest perhaps back to this area here, which is around about 68.90, 68.80, which was the lows there, there and there. So you should find a fairly decent area of support 
through that area around about 68.90 if we can sustain this move lower. So certainly what the Aussie and the Kiwi are telling me and the Canada are telling me is the dollar looks as if it may be set for a little bit of a rebound. Okay, ladies and gents, um, time's up actually. Um, hopefully um, you've um, got some clarity um, from the numbers. Um, don't forget I do do a weekly video which gets posted on the YouTube channel um, every week. Um, it should be going up there in the next couple of hours. But hopefully um, that, that's it for this week. Thank you very much for your time, your company. And um, I'll see you same time, same place a month from now for the non-farm payrolls webinar for February, which will be on the 3rd of March. Thanks very much for listening and have a great weekend. Thank you very much.